Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, 20 cores of hyper-threaded joy. It was a rough week for AMD, exploding memory speed myths, slay the monster in your cable drawer, and auto overclock. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 191, recorded on October 18th, 2012. Memory Performance Myths. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is a new mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting, pay for what you use, it doesn't require a contract, and offers unlimited devices on one pooled plan. To save $50 on your first Ting device, visit twitch.ting.com. That's twitch.ting.com. Welcome to Twitch. This week in computer hardware, I'm Patrick Norton, and this is the show on Twitch where we try to bring you the biggest, best, most important, and useful news on tech hardware, primarily PCs, a little bit of the tablet action, and yes, we love laptops more than, well, life itself. No, I'm kidding about that last one. We like pizza, and we especially like Ryan Trout, and I want a little love out of the audience tonight because Ryan is suffering through a <laughs> cascading series of technical difficulties, including it seems power like outages. That's- more frequently Plays. than not, that seems to be how the intros go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I th- I, it's, it's self-inflicted pain, right? You deal with the latest stuff. You're trying to push. You're trying to build a $50,000 live video production feed for $500. And this is the kind of pain you have to deal with, I guess. But uh, it's not fun, but it happens. As long as the power stays on, we'll be okay. <laughs> so, so, ladies and gentlemen, think positive and keep the electrons flowing inside of the PC Per offices. Twit.tv slash Twitch is where you can find all the previous episodes of This Week in Computer Hardware. You can subscribe to the show there. If you want to email us, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love answering your tech questions. We've got those coming up later in the show. Twitch at Twit.tv. And i got to remind everybody that it's T-W-I-C-H at Twit.tv. Uh, Probably the biggest story for us this week just broke in the last couple days. AMD loses $157 million in Q3. It's going to lay off 15% of its workers. Uh, Why do you care? Because while the entire world may be slowly moving to the ARM processor uh, over, say, a traditional PC architecture from Intel or AMD, AMD's pressure on Intel has traditionally kept or in the last decade has kept – PC processor price is more affordable. And AMD is having a rough, rough few months. Earlier this year, they basically said, we can no longer compete with Intel at the high end of the market. We're going to go for the the APUs. We're going to go for the performance, uh, kind of the overall bargain for performance. We're going to emphasize graphics processing uh, on our APUs. I mean, Ryan, is 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 AMD doomed at this point? Or, or am I just overreacting because that's the thing to do in the television news arena? You know, it's not an unpopular opinion. I will, I will, I'll give you that, right? So uh, do I think they're doomed? I think they are perhaps on a path to acquisition, if that is also the same thing, right? So what, what AMD has that is still very strong is a collection of GPU technologies, right? Their, their Radeon, their discrete GPUs are very competitive with NVIDIA's. I don't want to say they're the best, but they're but they're right up there. And they're way better than what Intel has. And they're, they, they could be used for all kinds of different instances, right? The APU is still a great idea. It is a, you know, a combined CPU, GPU in one part that has heavily uh, weights the GPU portion compared to what Intel does on their processors. The problem is, is that they have had problem after problem after problem in terms of CPU performance. If they were able to be competitive in that realm, uh, I think their GPU portion would carry them. And, and, you know, we reviewed Trinity on the desktop, we reviewed Trinity on the notebook, and it's actually a good part. That's the secret. Mm-hmm. It's actually an okay part. It's not great, but it's pretty good. And, and, and for the target audiences that they're going after, it's, it's a good part. And I don't, I don't really know. There, there was a time when AMD could get away with, with having a, a slower processor and still survive. But times, times have changed. We're moving into the mobile markets that AMD, like when I say mobile, I mean like tablet and phone, that AMD has close to zero market share and close to zero presence in. And that's really 
uh, as, as AMD CEO Roy Reed kind of said in the statement, right, is like the industry has changed and we have not kept up. And a company that, you know, think of companies that have done that in the past, like, uh, I don't know, RIM, right? They were, mm-hmm. they, they, the industry changed and they did not keep up and look at where they're at now. And I think it's pretty analogous to where AMD is. So you you are you are a little worried for your beloved AMD to say the least. I'm I'm worried. I would say mm-hmm. absolute worst case scenario. They totally exit uh CPU desktop businesses. Their discrete GPUs will live on. Uh, they would probably be acquired by another company, say Intel or something like that, somebody that could actually, you know, I I don't know how that would work in terms of uh, the x86 licensing, but if Intel were to say buy off the GPU portion of AMD, you know, they would probably still keep that discrete market alive for, for a while to come. I don't think the worst case scenario is definitely, uh, I don't, I don't believe that's going to happen quite yet. Mm -hmm. I I think if, I don't know, it's, it's tough to say that I I still have a lot of faith in what they're, what they're going to be able to do in the APU market. We're talking about losing 14 or 1700 employees, whatever it is this quarter, again, you know, almost a year after they dropped that same number. Or more, well, okay. I think. They obviously, of course, still have a strong presence in the graphics market and the in the discrete GPU market. Um, you know, is that good? Is that the future uh, of AMD? It's not really the future of anything. Is the problem <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the discrete. I, was, I, was... I mean, but I mean, that's 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 the that's the problem. Is their best hope is a market that is shrinking rapidly. It's never going to go away completely, but uh, it's shrinking rapidly, and it's it's a problem for AMD because that's with their that's their strength, and it's a problem for Nvidia still too. That's still their strength. Uh, they're trying to get in other markets with Tegra. It's been a slow process, but they're you know they're making inroads. AMD has made no such inroads on their own side, and they're kind of struggling to, to tread water in the CPU market, in the desktop market, and in the notebook market. And if your anchor, so to speak. Uh, or your floaty, if you want to go the other way, is is a shrinking market. That's not good news. Well, as much as it pains me to step away from this utterly depressing story, <laughs> let us move on to excess and unhinged productivity. If you're the kind of person that has been sitting around staring at your computer thinking what I just need is another six, four cores, uh, you're going to be mm-hmm, excited mm-hmm. about a processor you probably can't afford. Uh, the new 10-core Xeon E5 2600 V2 Ivy Bridge dash EP CPU. Uh, Tim Vary wrote this up for PCPer.com. Uh, basically, uh, a recently leaked slide reveals one of Intel's upcoming Xeon branded server chips coming in Q3 2013. Uh, Ivy Bridge EP processor, uh, LGA 2011 compatible. With a whopping, brace yourselves, kids, uh, 10 cores, a 70 watt uh, thermal design power rating. Um, no, excuse me, the, the, excuse me, the E20, the, basically there's two generations of the chips coming in, 70 watt uh, TDP and 130 watt TDP. Uh, but the E5 2600 is going to be rocking 10 physical cores. And with hyper threading, it can support up to 20 threads. Uh, each physical core has access to 256 kilobits of uh, kilobytes of L2 cache, uh, 30 megabytes of L3 cache. Quote, further, this and other Ivy Bridge EP processors will support up to 1866 megahertz DDR3 of system RAM. And apparently this is a middle-of-the-road part for Intel uh, that they're actually going to release up to 12 physical cores, 24 threads simultaneously uh, rock in on the 22 nanometer manufacturing process and three uh, like the, the new 3D transistor uh, technology we've been talking about in the yep. past. Um, so if you are looking for an excessive number of cores to process your incredibly well-threaded application, uh, this might be the excuse you've been looking for to buy a server part and install it on your desktop or workstation. At least, at least in Q3 2013, it can be. Okay. <laughs> So uh, save your pennies because you're going to need all of them. Right. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's supposedly also using the Socket 2011. Mm-hmm. 
well, the 2011 socket, LGA 2011 socket that Sandy Bridge E was released on. So there's a possibility, even if it's kind of slim, that you'll be able to use, like if you have a Sandy Bridge E system, you'll be able to do this. I'm hesitant to say that it will. I, there, There is probably likely a chance that Intel will require, you know, like new motherboard, new power plane, all that kind of stuff for it. Um, but we're also talking about a processor with up to 30 megs of L3 cache on it as well. It's pretty impressive stuff, right? So it's maybe it's taking longer than it should, but even without AMD as a, as a big threat in the high-performance CPU workplace, uh, they are pushing performance ahead, at least somewhat. 12 cores in a single, single chip. It's pretty good. No waiting. 12 cores, no waiting. <laughs> Uh, we, we've talked a bunch about how memory speeds are not something you should freak out over. You know, uh, get the 1333 DDR3 memory. You'll be happy. You'll fine. You know, you want to spend the extra money for the 2400. Don't expect a lot out of it. Uh, but a really great article uh, by Ian uh, Cutrus up on Anantech.com. Memory performance, 16 gigabyte DDR3 1333 to DDR3 2400 on Ivy Bridge IGP. Uh, with G Skill is the name of the article. Um, it's really interesting. Basically, uh, he's been sitting and thinking like, how do I test memory? Right? There's synthetic benchmarks, which basically, you know, synthetic benchmarks get yay! Look at all this more performance, but there's no real world correlation. So they started looking at uh, uh, they started looking at uh, integrated graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, and and since they actually access the main system memory um, as they're pushing data around, that this would be a way to actually test things. So they uh, they talked to G Skill. G Skill loaned us a giant stack of memory kits, or excuse me, I should say she loaned. Uh, pardon me, uh, Anantech dot com, a giant stack of kits, um, eight hundred. So uh, DDR three, where did they go? Uh, basically, uh, thirteen thirty two megahertz, twenty one thirty three megahertz, and. They started looking at what became interesting is how CAS latency, you know, RAS to CAS, RAS pre-charge, row active time, row cycle time, command rate. Uh, and it's really interesting. One, because it links back to earlier articles that talk about how memory works and like why you may or may not care about CAS latency. Uh, right. And then they just ran a ton of benchmarks and started really working through the details and then running one, two, three, four, five different sets of memory uh, to get an idea of, of how it would actually impact real world performance, especially on games. Um, and it's, you know, and also looking at rendering and some other stuff. If you've ever wondered about memory and its impact on the performance of your games or other applications to your PC, I highly recommend it. If you are feeling about it, if you want to get your geek on and read a lot about memory, uh, it's really, really interesting because, you know, one of Ian's kind of closing paragraphs out of there, writing this review has taken a lot longer than expected. Initially, it comes down to what benchmarks should be run. There are a lot of synthetic results out in the wild from many sources, and I wanted to focus on real-world scenarios to aid buying decisions. Hopefully, I've had a good number of different scenarios where buying that higher-rated memory kit actually makes a difference. IGP Gaming is the key, one often quoted, but other options such as Maya, WinRAR compression, and USB 3.0 throughput were all and this is my words, not Ian's, were all actually dramatically, or at least in terms of the benchmark, dramatically impacted by actually going to faster memory. Um, it was a really interesting read. I'm, I'm actually working through it my second time. We're going to actually try to have Ian on uh, Techzilla in the next week or two to talk about it. But it's really interesting to look at how not just the overall clocking speed, uh, but how, uh, you know, well, I mean, basically as memory kits get faster, subtimings can start to suffer uh, mm -hmm. And I, I'm not going to go any farther than that because I want you to go up to Anantech.com and, and read the article because it's a really interesting read and some really interesting testing went into this to try to look at, at the real world difference that memory uh, speeds actually make. So it was, yep, it was, was good. <laughs> so I, it was a nice job of geeking out with the benchmarks. And, and the good news is that the, 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 the kits that he tested – it's not like they ranged from twenty bucks to three hundred dollars. They went from oh. seventy five to one hundred and forty five. So, uh, starting at the the base thirteen thirty three up to the the highest speed twenty four hundred that they tested, you're only talking a difference of like seventy bucks essentially. Right, and that's a pretty. I mean, it's it's amazing because I was 
I was I've been looking at the RAM disk, the AMD's RAM disk software, and I'm like, I'm gonna go max out the memory on my system. And A, I realized that we're a long way away from that 512 gigabyte max because I think at this point I, I haven't found a, mem- a motherboard that claims to support more than 64 gigabytes in, with right. any chipset out there. Um, so it's a little heartbroken because I was ready to rock Windows 8 with like 128 gigabytes of RAM. Um, but then I realized like, wow, I could pick up 16 gigabytes of RAM for like 150, 160 bucks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, and actually 16, even less, uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM for like under $200, which sadly I don't think my mother board will support. So new gaming machine, Svelte, adorable. It's from Ava direct. What'd you think, man? So this, uh, this is the review we posted up this week. Uh, it was a, a welcome change from kind of the large beast mode machines that we tend to to get sent here. This is a mini ITX system. Uh, it used a was it the Prodigy or Bit Phoenix Prodigy chassis on it, which was which was kind of nice. It has this weird uh, fiber flex legs and and handles to it that mm-hmm. kind of they sway a little bit. Yeah, you can see them there, and they. They kind of have a little bit of flex, a little bit of sway to them if you were to like push the side of the case. And at first that kind of bothered me because it didn't seem very stable. But after kind of picking it up by those handles and like trying to shake it, you know, it's like, let's see if I can break this thing. <laughs> right. And uh, had no problems with it at all, uh, even by carrying the whole system by by one of those. So if you move your system a lot, you go to land parties, you, you know, it, it, you can... it's, it's good because it's a small case, it's a little bit lighter, easier to get around. And those those handles seem to be pretty good. The good news, though, is even though it's a mini ITX system, it's still got all the power you're going to want. It's got a Z77 uh, mini ITX motherboard from Asus. It's got, I think it had 8 gigs of memory, but you can obviously, you can have it configured however you want. But it had a Core i7-3770K overclocked to 4.4 gigahertz. And it had an NVIDIA, G, or has it, it had an EVGA, GeForce GTX 680 graphics card in it. So in terms of nice. gaming horsepower, it had pretty much top level components, right? Can you get a 690? Yeah. Can you get um, SLI? Sure. But in terms of a, a well-rounded, high, super high-end gaming solution, this this was it. And the benchmarks were there. Uh, it was overclocked CPU. So, you know, we kind of compared it to what our stock CPU scores. Just ran a couple of tests uh, to, to make sure CPU performed as we thought it should and the GPU performed as we thought it should. And it did. Cable cluttering uh, is very minimal in there. They did a really good job designing it. Um, and also, if you can kind of see back in those pictures, there's a huge Prolimatech CPU cooler in there. So it's not like uh, it's using some tiny Intel branded uh, CPU cooler or something like that. It's, I mean, it, every inch of the inside of this case is occupied by something. Um, now, in terms of pricing, one of the things that I thought was, was pretty compelling about it was that I took these exact same components, built it out on Newegg, and it was about $250 more to buy it from AVA Direct. And what do you get from that? You get uh, you get a three-year warranty. You get it put together. You get it overclocked. Um, you don't have to worry about DOA parts. You just get one, either the system starts or it doesn't, right? It's kind of been burned in a little bit from that. And I know we're, we're mostly a DIY podcast. PC Perspective is mostly a DIY website. But I think as... Our audience is getting older. They have less time. They have more. We want to play games, but we don't want to necessarily spend time troubleshooting that kind of stuff. That the going from nineteen hundred dollars to twenty one hundred and fifty dollars for for the system, the components that you want, it kind of is like uh, maybe people are starting to waver there. It's like okay, I'll let them do that. It's completely open componentry, right? If they're using off the shelf parts, if you want to upgrade things, you want to change things, you can absolutely do that. Um, but it's it's is a pretty nice overall package anyway to boot so it's it doesn't have a real good name it's just called the mini gaming pc like they don't have a specific brand for uh, that model Uh, it's 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 clear it's simple it's obvious mini gaming pc it's mini gaming gaming pc PC. small i guess it's mini not small gaming pc I right. like, you know what? Let's not worry about the name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, and it shook it and was impressed. I did. I, I tried to break it and it didn't break. <laughs> Always a So there you go. It's something. You also got hands on with the Patriot Gauntlet 320 external wireless hard drive. And this sounds like a cousin to a certain Seagate product. Uh, uh, you know, it is. I, I've, I've, I've seen it, but I've never actually used that Seagate drive. Have you, have you had hands on experience with like the wireless hard drive? Yes. 
the okay. satellite wireless. It's pretty cool. It's essentially it's it's a Wi-Fi router and hard drive. Well, essentially it's a hard drive uh, that does Wi-Fi too. That's the shortest way of describing it. Right. Um, only so, sold in the five hundred gigabyte option. It's two hundred bucks from Seagate. Okay, so this is a three hundred twenty gig option. It's one hundred and forty nine dollars on Newegg. Um, it's you know it's. I had never used a wireless hard drive. So when they offered to send one to me, I was like, I mean, okay, I don't really see how this is going to be beneficial. It, it uses a two and a half inch drive. It's a little bit bigger than a standard two and a half inch drive dock would be because it has a lithium ion battery in it. So it'll last for five something, I think five and a half hours, they claim on that. It has 802.11 BGNN. It has USB 3.0, which is nice. So when you do that initial copy of all your media to it, you can do that over USB 3 and, and kind of get that over there. Um, it's interesting. My, my, my main issue going into this kind of video review that we did was what are the use cases for this? Why does somebody want a wireless hard drive? And, you know, there are some specific cases. You are a student or an employee and you need to go have, you know, you have group project meetings and you can just turn mm -hmm. on your hard drive and share your files with everybody right there. Everybody just kind of connects to it and they, and they get that. Uh, data access. Maybe you're in a small office or a, an apartment or something like that, and you just want to have shared uh, st drive storage there, but you don't have Ethernet all over the place, and you don't want to have it necessarily attached to any one particular system or something like that. You know, so no computer has to be on the whole time for you to get access to that data. So there, there are some use cases for it. I found um, uh, the USB performance was fine. The wireless performance is a little slow. It shows up just like any other network drive, so you can map it as a, as a drive learner on Windows. You can map it in Mac. It has iOS and Android apps as well, which will allow, on, on Android at least, on tablet or phone, will let you copy files to and from the hard drive to your phone. iOS mm -hmm. has you know, restrictions where you can't do that, but you can stream videos right. and photos and anything, any media. It'll, it'll be able to stream off of there. So it does, it does a pretty good job with that. And if you're not interested in this model, you can get mm -hmm. what they have, the Patriot Gauntlet node, which is mm -hmm. just the dock, right? So you can mm -hmm. add, bring your own hard drive to it. So if you're like me and you have a laptop and you took out a 500 gig hard drive and you put in 128 gig SSD or something like that, and you have that two and a half inch notebook drive, you don't really know what to do with. This would be a, a pretty good idea. I think it's 99 bucks for that. That's uh, so you cool. can just install it. You got the battery, you got the connectivity and, and, and use it. If you don't, it's it's might just be nice to have it as an option, right? It's still USB 3.0 external hard drive. You don't have to use the battery. You don't have to use the uh, wireless feature if you don't want to. Uh, but if you do want to, you have that option, right? So, for me, it was like having you know 500 gigabytes available at my iPad or my iPhone so that I could have right. this huge amount of media, you know, accessible inside of my car was really cool. Um, yeah, you know, that, that's that's one of the big sell points. Yeah, so. Always want more. I guess that's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, we talk about getting more and more and more on the podcast. And, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, sometimes you have to pay for it. Sometimes you don't. Uh, if you've got a question about a cheap upgrade or whether or not an upgrade is worth your money, why don't you email us, twitch, twich, twit.tv. Uh, and, of course, if you're new to the podcast, do us a favor, subscribe uh, using you know iTunes or whatever your favorite podcatcher is, or just go watch the shows at twit.tv slash twitch. And we should take a moment to thank our sponsor, who's working awfully hard to save you some money on your wireless costs. Team. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's it's our it's our revisit from the new sponsor, and I still am as interested and excited about the idea of what they're doing. Um, so Ting is an MVNO, which is basically a network reseller um, mm -hmm. of the nationwide Sprint network. So Ting Ting basically can resell Sprint services, but they do it in a much more discreet manner and i don't mean uh, quietly i mean like individualized <laughs> they can they can break things apart they have things uh that, that differentiate them like they don't have any contracts or etfs it's completely contract free no early terminations none of that other garbage no bundling or ride along services you know you can you can select exactly how many minutes you want exactly how many texts you want exactly how many uh megabytes of data you want and it you can choose them completely independently. There's no overage charges or penalties. If you use more than you thought you would, you just pay for that next rung of, of service. Right. And if you go over the, the XL, which is their biggest one, or the XXL, which is the biggest one, like the fees are 
two cents a text message instead of 25 cents a text message. So think about those those differences. You get credits on unused service, which is really cool too. So if you sign up for the thousand minute plan, but you lose less than 500, you know, they'll put, they'll push you back to that 500 minute plan or they'll, they'll keep you there, but they'll credit you that difference, right? So they're not going to try to take advantage of you to get you to sign up for the 2000 minute plan if you don't need it, which is a welcome change as well. Uh, no yeah, mysterious line yeah. items on your bill. Ting charges you for what you use, plus whatever taxes. No hidden charges, recovery fees, or any other crap. Uh, unlimited devices on one plan. You can have as many devices as you want on one plan. Sharing, pulled minutes, uh, messages, and mags, right? So you don't um, have to worry about a, a four-limit plan for your family or something like that. Uh, a powerful online account control panel, which is nice to see. Take control of your account. You can view your bills, change things back and forth. They have a no-hold customer support. If you call if you call 1-855-TING-FTW, anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern, a real person will pick up the phone. Apparently, you will never be on hold, which I'm willing to bet has not been the case if you've ever called any of the other <laughs> operators before. And they have excellent online support at help.ting.com with uh, active forums, simple and powerful help ticketing system, video tutorials, startup guides, and a whole lot more. So how's it work? You purchase your mobile device from Ting, which you will receive in two to five business days. Then you activate your device with Ting and have the option to select a new phone number or to port you know, whatever number you already have. Finally, you select the monthly minutes, messages, and megabyte plans that you think represent your usage, and Ting will bill you at the beginning of your payment period, uh, but you will be charged or credited in the following pay period based on what you actually used. So if you think you'll use 1,000, but you only use 500, you'll get credited that difference, which is which is pretty impressive. So what we want you to do, it's really simple. I, I think if you've heard our pitch that you're you're very interested to see what they have, go to Ting, uh, you're, you're going to go to twitch.ting.com. That's T-W-I-C-H dot T-I-N-G dot com. Save money and better manage your mobile phone usage with Ting. Check out their savings calculator on the website as well, which you can see how much uh, money you or your company can save. Because if you have a small business, you can use this. There's no limit to the number of phones you can have on your plan. Uh, And also, since you are obviously a Twitch viewer or listener, you can save $50 on your first Ting device when you sign up. So visit twitch.ting.com and start saving today. Nice to see some change in the U.S. cellular market. Hold on a second. I'm actually finishing my order on uh, twitch.ting.com. I'm actually in real time buying a new mobile hotspot. I'm impressed. I like it. (laughs) I'll let you know how it goes. (laughs) Sounds good. uh, I haven't had a a wireless modem for a while, and it's kind of sucked not having it. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They are handy. Uh, oh, I had one for years, and I got really yeah. frustrated actually because of what I was being charged. Um, so this is going to be exciting. Okay, Should ten business good. days or less for the free FedEx standard shipping. I'm going for it. No, actually, I'm Ooh. going to pay an extra and get the express because <laughs> you know that's he wants that now. Pay. He wants that service oh, yeah. now because you're a paragon of patience when ordering new hardware. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. Earlier yeah. today, I was wandering around Northern Kentucky trying to find a shotgun mic, and there are none in Northern Kentucky. And uh, uh, overnight shipping was not fast enough. That's a bad feeling. Twitch yeah. at twitch.tv is the email address. Let's start out with our, uh, our, our first viewer question is coming from Don. He's got a question about storing cables. He says, what do you use to store all of the spare cables, adapters? Thanks to Apple, I now have 27 kinds and other PC hardware that you manage to collect or keep around. I'm in need of something that will please my wife as well as allow me to find what I am looking for easily. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite geeks in the world has the classic cable drawer and occasionally when i'm over at said person's house and in their office i open up the cable drawer and i like to just start pulling cables out because one you get this giant mess that looks like a writhing bunch of medusian snakes uh you literally pull out at this point it's so it's it's just sort of it's like 40 pounds of copper and plastic and odd connectors and it's really fun because i like to see like what the oldest cable i can find in there is because invariably there's some stuff that nobody's used uh in a decade (laughs) but He's yeah, going around like that. old scuzzy, you know, you know, vintage <laughs> scuzzy cables and stuff. This is not the best way to store cables. Um, I'm a huge <laughs> fan of 
of Ziploc bags. I am a huge fan because I've, I've worked in studios for so long, or I should say worked near studios, uh, lest uh, Burke, our beloved producer, start twitching um, in the facial tick sense of the word, um, in that you learn how to properly wind cables up. Uh, you know, Would you call it folding or winding, Burke? How would you call storing cables properly in a studio? Putting them Jesus away. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you have you have to you have to uh, put. Yes, I guess it would be wrap them. I call them. I would say you're wrapping the cable, but it really is a folding. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Veronica Belmont actually did a demonstration of that on Texilla because she has an audio uh, producing background. But basically, you know, you fold them correctly, you tie them off with a, a piece of string that's not going to chafe through the covering, and then you store them. Uh, preferably on hooks on the wall or in my case uh, when I'm really organized I put cables inside of Ziploc bags because then I can just either pour the bundle of Ziploc bags out or search for the Ziploc bags and actually see the cables I'm looking for mm-hmm. and they're clean and yes. they're clean yeah you can throw them around <laughs> at that, that I've, I've used both methods but like yes <laughs> but you definitely need to know how to Wrap them properly so you don't destroy them, and it keeps them. It doesn't right. get twisted, and then you can keep right. them around us forever. It definitely depends what size the cables and adapters you're talking about are. Definitely. I have thirty-five foot HDMI cables. They aren't going right. to fit in a Ziploc bag. Not true. Sure they will. That's not true. Big Ziploc bags. <laughs> but yes, pra- for practical purposes, absolutely. Uh, we also have like a thirty-five foot dual link DVI cable, and uh, we have like these big long Velcro strips that we use to kind of tie them off, and like plastic one of them bins. won't get around it. Uh, we we do use plastic bins eventually, but uh, just in terms of organizing for small ones, I bought. We just like at the hardware store, they have like the little plastic um, drawer thing, and the thing is, you can put you know, matching ones and those. And because they're clear drawers, you can kind of see what's in there without having to open them and, and go around them and that kind of stuff too. Yeah, I think the biggest issue is stopping, uh, you know, giving yourself like a day to detangle your collection of cables, <laughs> yeah, source your least. collection of cables, you know, fold, spindle, mutilate, bend, or however you plan on storing them and then labeling them and then just actually keeping it up after that. Tr- yeah, you can- the keep up is the hard part. Try desperately... <laughs> Not to just go, just because if you do it just one day, uh, where's right. this cable go? Uh, it doesn't matter. And you just throw it into a stack. You will have right. what I have, which is we <laughs> had at one point well-organized video adapters that are now, we have four shell, like four little shelving units of random video adapters. <laughs> Turn the camera I, I, around. Let's see it. No, no, no. Yeah. Lights are all shame. lights are off. It couldn't possibly Pure shame. Seem. I am. Words, I mean, when at one point... Um, uh, at one point, a friend of mine started collecting power cables for PCs in a lab he was working at in a very large lab for a very large magazine. Yeah. Um, and uh, when he left that particular uh, testing lab, he willed his – at this point, it was like a 27-gallon stackable tub you get from Lowe's or Home Depot uh, full of power cables. <laughs> So I would also say that even though you're quite sure you're going to use that collection of vintage SCSI Terminators at some point in the future, that, that you know, repelling the aliens will require somebody <laughs> that can, can can run like OS 7.1 OS yeah. 10, or like OS 7.1 uh, off of a vintage, you know, Micropolis SCSI drive. The reality is, is, is you, you're probably not going to need it and you should, you know. You might you reuse the power cord. Vintage. That's probably about it. I have to, I have yeah. to point out I have to point out this comment in in the chat room. Jerry Lee Lewis says it's easier to get new cables than it is to find the ones you already have, <laughs> and I live by that mantra. Mm. It's like, do we have any uh, extra Monoprice. cables? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Monoprice. I'll have it here tomorrow. That's fine. And you just move on from that kind of stuff. It's unfortunately a little and bit you wasteful. Have more cables, but true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a never ending cycle of never finding the things that you already have. Never had an ex cycle of greed and exploitation of the Earth's resources wife, and use, sir. My wife knows all about it. Nope. <laughs> Too long before she had to use. Brian writes in, hey, Ryan and Patrick, good time. Excuse me, long-time listener to both Twitch and the PC Per Podcast. Great shows. I look forward to them every week. Thank you, Brian. He says, I'm looking to eventually run one of the famous 27-inch 2560 by 1440 monitors from eBay. Hopefully, Santa, a.k.a. the wife, is in a good mood this year. I'd like to be running two MSI twin Forzer Radeon or Frozen? Frozer. Uh, Frozer. Sorry, there was a missing R a- there. Radeon 7950s or two 660 Ti's by the time I get the monitor. 
I'd also like to have the option to add a third card if and when I feel it, uh, feel the need, feel I need it. Oh, my goodness. I'd like to call and edit it in. I'd also like to have the option to add a third card if and when I feel I need it. So far, this board is the cheapest I can find, the MSI Z77A G45 up on Newegg. But I've read, if I've read some of my Googling correct, it can only do three-way crossfire, not three-way SLI, question mark, due to the third 2.0 by 16 slot, question mark. Thanks in advance, guys. Any clarification would be great. Can you help so, Brian Trout? <laughs> so the... If it can do three-way crossfire, mm -hmm. it can physically, electrically do three-way SLI. The problem with the Z77 chipset is uh, the, P the primary PCI Express only comes from the, from the CPU. So it gets split into two by eight lanes. The third, sh the third slot, the tertiary PCI Express slot, actually comes from the south bridge. And it runs... Uh, at by four at a previous generation PCI Express. So there is going to be a somewhat significant performance difference between the second, uh, the, the first two PCI Express slots and the last one. Now, I just was, was Googling, just actually was going to SI's site on this particular motherboard and, and bless you. It does say, let me see what we got here. Um, no on three-way SLI, yes on crossfire. No on four-way SLI, go figure, I guess. Um, I actually don't think I would recommend running three-way crossfire on this board either. If you want to do three-way or four-way, you're looking at more expensive motherboards. You're looking for something that has uh, uh, PCI Express switches on them, PCI Express bridge chips on them, like the P8Z77V Premium from Asus or the GD80. Does the GD80 have that on there from MSI? I don't know. There, there, there's an MSI board. Uh, the, the Z77 Empower, I think, will also do uh, three-way and four-way support as well. And I think the, the MSI GD80, if you want to stick with the MSI options. But honestly, I think if you're... I think two-way SLI or Crossfire, probably mm -hmm. enough. And if you start getting into three, you're getting into diminishing returns at that point, and it may make more sense to upgrade to a faster single card. Um, right. But but this board would be perfect for SLI or Crossfire, either one. It's just you know I I hesitate to even recommend kind of doing three way of either <laughs> vendor, to be honest. So it, it it sounds like a good idea uh, until you actually try to use it in in the real world in practice right um, yeah I, it was funny i was i was laughing i was up on the gigabyte website earlier today searching for a motherboard that would support uh more than 64 gigabytes of ram <laughs> and it amazed me um how frustrating and, and this is i i, I mentioned gigabyte because that was a website i was on but many of the other uh motherboard vendors are just as bad where it's like they have like 15 different motherboards on each chipset and uh Yep. You know, it's the differences between the motherboards can get real obscure really quickly, which I find immensely frustrating. Uh, unless, of course, it's like the chainsaw dog stomper 4000 with genuine dog fur over the chipset or something. Uh, in which case, it's just kind of creepy. Now, as much as I've enjoyed this week in home construction, let us turn back to technology. We got an email from Mark about over auto auto overclocking. Over auto clocking. Let's over auto clock our cars. <laughs> Mark says I'm curious as to how well motherboards. Actually, no, we were still talking about. Uh, uh, we were still actually talking about uh, uh, motherboards. Three, two. So I'm actually with you, Ryan. It would be killer if there was a chart. That would make it simple for me to figure out what features were supported by which motherboard. Um, do, you think, do, they, do you think they're tracking clicks and time spent on the website? You know, at Gigabyte, Nasus, and other websites. No, I, yeah, I really, I really have no idea why they don't do that. It's their their websites, just in general, support sites are not extremely user friendly to begin with. So this is just an extension of that. To be perfectly honest, I think that's 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 not good. Well, in any case, Brian, stick to two GPUs. Yeah. <laughs> if you need a third one, spend more money on individual GPUs. You will have Mark's to. got a question about uh, what I like to call over-auto clocking, but is normally considered to be auto-overclocking. He writes, I'm curious as to how well motherboards with auto-overclocking work. I'm not wanting extreme OCing with some DIY water cooling or trying to make the fastest machine out there. 
I'm thinking of using a self-contained system like the Corsair H80 and trying to get a little more bang out of the new components. Is there a difference in auto overclocking ability and features? Does one brand stand out from the rest? What parts of the system are affected by the overclocking? Finally, I know you've mentioned the stress test tools you've used in the past, but I wasn't paying very close attention. So if you could run through the names one more time, it would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> I'm thinking of an i5 3570K, 16 gigs of DDR3 1600, a Samsung SSD, and a GeForce GTX 660. I want to game on your machine. I'm gaming at 1920 by 1080 with some productivity work for a home business. I'd like to run at high or ultra settings in games at least for a while. So, Auto overclocking is interesting. It is yeah. a. It has been a slow progression from jumpers to bio switches to single button push overclocking or software based overclocking uh msi was really the first one i think maybe the first one to do it and there's this branded oc genie and there's a physical button on the motherboard that you push it uh takes about two extra seconds it looks at all your components and it sets new clock speeds now here's here's the secret for that and um what asus does in their bios i can't remember what the what they call that Auto, I should know nah, auto tune is, auto -tune is something they do in Windows. But so the idea is they're not actually testing, like OCG doesn't actually test your hardware and try to find the best settings. They're basically, they have a database that MSI has built and these other vendors have built that says, okay, we know what this processor should do with this memory, with this voltage, right? And they kind of set it at a safe, stable level so that they don't worry about, you know, frying your system or it making unstable. There's less chance of that, right? Mm -hmm. Asus has a version of that in their BIOS as well. Then if you yeah. look at some, that's the, that's the easiest. Yeah, it's, it's the easiest thing to do. It's the most consistent. It is the most reliable. Uh, I mean, literally, like on the MSI GD80 board, you just turn it off, push the button, turn it back on, and you get, you know, a few hundred, three, four, five hundred megahertz of additional clock speed out of it. Great. Right. There's another version from that I know Asus has. I don't know if uh, MSI has or Gigabyte has where it's called Auto-Tune. I think it's called mm -hmm. Auto-Tuner. And it's actually a piece of software in Windows. And what it does is it actually changes settings, does a little stress test, changes settings, does a little stress test back and forth until it reboots. Then it starts when it kind of like reboot crashes, it'll reboot, start itself off. It knows where it left off and it will adjust things back and forth. And in those cases, you can get uh, a little bit closer to say what you would be able to get out of manual time-consuming overclock. It will adjust CPU. It will adjust memory timings. Uh, I, think, I think it will also adjust integrated graphics performance if that's, if that's something you're interested in. And I, and I find that pretty useful. It's a little bit scarier watching your system kind of do this thing, crash, reboot, do this thing, crash, reboot. But then it, at the end, you get a result screen that says, hey, um, here's your new clock speed. Here's your percentages up. And uh, we think this will be safe. So I, I, I'm actually fairly impressed with how most of these vendors are doing that kind of stuff now. And I, as a secret, I think for most people, that's, that's going to be enough in terms of overclocking. Yeah, I, it's, it's funny. I've, I've found it kind of, as somebody who's done some hardcore overclocking, I've found the auto overclockers yeah. a little frustrating. Um, uh, Tom's Hardware actually did an interesting article about a year ago where they looked at uh, four Z68 motherboards, you know, from like 220 to 280 bucks, and they looked at um, what the as, as you know, I want to say where okay, so the Asus OC tuner, the ASRock the optimized CPU OC, um, manual overclocking, um, and basically like the MSI OC Genie, the Gigabyte Smart Quick Boost, and what was interesting in some cases was how these uh, automated uh, uh, overclockers did some really squirrely things in terms of, say, CPU voltage. For example, um, huh. turning the voltage up over like 1.45 volts on a standing bridge processor when, generally speaking, you don't want to go up above 1.4 volts. Um, that was kind of one of the unusual ones. But, well, yeah, I mean, you can argue, but yeah, the closer yeah, yeah. you get to 1.5 volts, in theory, you're going to start decreasing sure. CPU life, right? But um, so it was, you know... Um, it's interesting as you as you you know you start experimenting with this when when they did the chart like you know the Asus uh, uh, Z sixty eight was like you know forty seven twenty five uh, and the slowest was the ASRock uh, Z sixty eight Extreme seven at forty six forty three forty six forty three uh, hertz so it's like 
it was interesting that you know they all got the same maximum base clock. Uh, they also got very similar data rates, or within like a hundred hertz right. on the data rates. So these are all working. Um, you know, and, and it's you know it's something like get it overclock it if you auto overclock it if you want to. Then you start playing around with the settings and see whether or not you can get any more out of it. But uh, I love the idea. Um, um, but yeah. the, you know, the other flip side is is CPUs are so fast these days. Unless you're dealing with like high end gaming, um, video editing, massive audio or photo editing, um, it's almost impossible to max out your CPU in its stock configuration. You've got like a Core i five or a Core i seven. So um, you know the days the days where you'd like overclock and get like an extra twenty percent performance don't really exist anymore. Um, it, Except in very uh, specific cases, like, you know, if you're doing video yeah. transcoding, you'll see that. If you're doing gaming, True. you won't see that. Um, you know, so there, there's just, I hate to say it, it sounds, it sounds like a, a defeatist attitude where overclocking doesn't matter. And that's not 100% <laughs> true, but it matters a lot less than it right. did. I, I can't argue that even a little bit. Yeah. Should we do one more question before we go? Sure. Or are we out of time, sir? Well, we we can do we want to do one more. Um, we can do an email from uh, Vane about this one. This one will be pretty easy. This is um, they, it has a question about Windows eight installation stuff. <laughs> so he says, I've recently bought a new computer. It's an iBuy Power C seventeen. I, I think it's a notebook. It has a two hundred forty gig SSD, one terabyte hard drive, thirty two gigs of memory. Okay, maybe not. A GeForce GTX six seventy five M. Okay, it is a four gig card. And an Ivy Bridge quad core i7 processor, pretty pretty killer rig for for a laptop, especially. He currently has the OS installed on the SSD. However, some of my friends said they would have installed the OS on the hard drive. And now with Windows 8 coming out, I thought I would dual boot my computer with Windows 7 and Windows 8. However, the only way I know how to dual boot is uh, by partitioning, and I've heard it is a bad idea to partition SSDs. So my question is, which drive should I put the OS or OSs on my computer? Uh, before, oh, sorry, my computer before this was really old and slow, so I don't know much of the computers and speed to the SSD. Does the SSD really make that much of a difference? Uh, yes. SSD mm -hmm. is good, making a huge difference. I don't, I've yeah. never heard the uh, sentiment that you should install the OS on a hard drive. I mean, I guess, I mean, it's a, it's a 240 gig SSD. That's also, it's a pretty big SSD, right? So I don't understand the point of installing the OS on the hard drive. Uh, and I also, to be completely honest with you, don't understand the point of dual booting Windows 7 and Windows 8. <laughs> I mean, either you want to have Windows 8 or you don't. Right. Windows 7 is not going away anytime soon. Um, I would say if it were me, if you're okay formatting, format install Windows 8 on your 240 gig SSD and, and be happy with your system. Um, I guess the idea is you can store more applications on your solid state drive without the OS data on there, right? So the, the OS may take a little bit longer to load and to boot, but your applications that you'll use will be a little bit faster than that. But you got to think of all the caching that Windows does and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and it's going to... Unless you go in and change all those things manually, that's all going to use whatever the OS partition is. There you have it. Yeah. I, I guess I don't... I don't... I guess people are good... Are people going to dual boot Windows 7 and Windows 8? It seems uh, really weird. I believe Vane is. <laughs> well, okay. Think about this. The next time we record this show, Patrick, it will be the Windows 8 Eve. That's a scary concept, dude. I wow. for, It's like it kind of jumped at me. Like I looked at the calendar and I was like, oh, oh, oh. When did that happen? Yeah, oh, well. Such is life. Ladies and gentlemen, Windows 8, it approaches. I'm actually, uh, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, uh, Windows 8, uh, the final version is really fast, even with four gigabytes of RAM. So I can't wait to get 16 gigabytes cool. running underneath it. Uh, and I also got to say, single best performance upgrade out there. If you can swing it, get an SSD. If you can't, uh, get an MSSD on your motherboard if it supports it. Uh, or a, uh, a uh, one of Seagate's hybrid drives that includes a gigantic chunk of cash to give you SSD-like performance. Uh, with a lot more uh, traditional rotating media storage. I love my SSD, though. Mm. It is so fast and so nice, and I love it so much. And on that bright and cheerful note, <laughs> what's coming up on PC Per, man? Uh, so Obviously, we are going to have some Windows 8 stuff. I think, actually, I think I keep saying this, but 
I'm going to rebuild my own system. It's been a long time since I've rebuilt my own system, put Windows 8 on it, kind of give people video overview of what the initial kind of setup and introductory period is like for those who are still making the decision about installing Windows 8 or not. Oh. Uh, we have, uh, we actually have a review going up later tonight of the Asus RT N66U router, dual band um, Asus router. It is uh, pretty impressive and probably MSI Thunderbolt motherboard as well, at the least. It'll be a busy week, actually. We'll have, we'll have some other Windows 8 stuff going on. The Thunderbolt motherboards that are available to do Hackintoshes, which uh, we're actually working on in Texilla, uh, are so awesome. Um, we should point out to Mark, who asked about auto overclocking, Prime 95 uh, oh, yeah. is the classic uh, abuse your CPU memory and motherboard, uh, sort of the burn-in. If, if, if your system runs this for like 48 or 72 hours and doesn't explode, it's probably going to run just fine. Uh, some of the crueler people I know run a graphics uh, uh, exercise, a video game or a benchmark. They loop it. Um, to exercise the GPU while Prime 95 right. is using the cores. Uh, but Prime 95 is kind of the classic burn-in software if you want to see what the outside borderline, oh my goodness, my processor is about to explode. Basically, whether or not your, your heat sink is doing its job and everything's uh, got decent air cooling inside of there. Yeah, uh, Techzilla, we've got a Windows 8 special coming up later in the week. Uh, and we have... Uh, we have a Hackintosh build coming in the near future, and we are waiting with bated breath for Windows Phone 8 because it's so pretty. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we got our Hackintosh build and a Winatron build. And uh, I got to say, I'm getting excited about getting like 16 gigs of memory in my Core i5 box and playing around with uh, AMD's uh, RAM drive software. Because I'll be getting back in touch with my 25-year-old self with RAM drives. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure. Ryan Shroud, it is good to see that your vocals are still in sync with your video. And uh, everybody. Eventually. Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> Twit.tv slash Twitch. Uh, if you want to email us, ask a question. Twitch at Twit.tv. And uh, thanks for watching. I'm Patrick Gordon. I'm Ryan Shroud. See you next week on Twitch. So I got this table this week that I thought you guys might be impressed by. Um, what's the brand? It's Newport. Kind of hard to impress me. It's a Newport table used in clean rooms for laser optics. Okay, I'm impressed. So it has it's basically Wait, 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 let's see it. Um right. Okay. Yeah. I see. I where's my it. If you go to facebookcom uh, pcper, uh -huh. you'll see a picture of it that I posted on there. Okay. Do I'm so now. impressed. Uh, and it has a bunch of little holes table? in the top of Whoa. it that are threaded. Let's suck it down. Oh, uh, wow. it's threaded so you can like bolt optics and and that kind of stuff to it lasers oh dude those are awesome those are really awesome yeah you can yeah i know exactly what how you're did you about. find this so uh, how did you afford that, it the guy well exactly the guy that does our uh post, cooling post a link C post a link when what's the link facebook.com slash pc per or what's the model of the table i don't know i didn't buy it new or anything Somebody uh, that works for me now worked for several like kind of research companies over the years and they were getting rid of, they were replacing a lot of stuff and he got this one mm -hmm. and it had been sitting in his basement for a while and asked if I wanted it. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do with it, but sure. It's essentially, <laughs> the, if, if you see in movies it, like geeks sitting around playing with lasers, if you ever looked at the table, it's got all these holes in it and so you can put all these armatures. I bet the top of it weighs they're incredibly awesome. Yeah. 200 pounds. Yes. There's and a whole page at least. up on the link I just put in the top. Yeah, they're kind of like assembly tables for for race cars and stuff, where it's like freaking three inches of solid steel. Like yeah, a, and they have to and they have to be seat. like inert and like the others. Just that's where yeah, they like start it's got awesome. stuff in it to be leveled and balanced and all that kind of stuff. I Do you have any of the pieces? Is it just the table and none of the fixtures? Just the table. Oh, okay. None, none of the cool. none of the fixtures. Yeah. Wow. Ken's favorite part is that if you take your hand and you rub it over over it, the holes like have the suction sound, so it sounds it sounds funny. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. It's, even if that's all we use it for, like I'm trying to figure out what we're gonna do with it, right? Because you know what, you it's, should, a, <laughs> it's like a four thousand dollar table, at least. Right.
And all I want to do is like, I was like, I guess I'll record videos in front of it. I don't know. Like, what, <laughs> what else do I got to do with that cool, cool of a table? Build it, make it a computer case. 